When I lived in Moscow during the mid-1990s, one of my favorite things to do on weekends was to wander around the Izmailovsky market. The Russian treasures and kitsch on display seemed endless. I'd pass from one table and stall to the next. Matroshka dolls, those famous stacking nesting dolls, as well as lacquer boxes and old pins from the Soviet era were everywhere. My favorite tables were filled with assortments of stemware, china, and linens. With the Russian economy in dire straits, people were cleaning out their cupboards to turn family heirlooms into dollars, pounds, and francs. And some real treasures could be found. I still have six tiny aperitif glasses that I picked up at an astonishingly low price. Wandering through Izmailovsky made me recall an earlier time when another group of Russians was forced to sell its family treasures in order to survive. You see, when the Bolsheviks came to power in 1917, retributive justice fell on the nobility like a sledgehammer. The nobility, although it numbered only about 1% of the population, had enjoyed enormous influence. It was the political, cultural, military, and social elite. Its fortunes mirrored that of the Russian czar estate. But as the autocracy fell in 1917, so did the nobility. And under the Soviet regime, even those who survived the revolutionary terror found themselves stripped of their possessions and privileges, and also of many of their options. In the new Soviet Union, erstwhile nobles and members of the bourgeoisie became known as former people who felt the onus of codified discrimination. As a result, the sight of aging aristocrats standing shivering in cold open air markets Selling the family jewels and furs became common. Finding a buyer for these heirlooms might be emotionally devastating, but it could mean the difference between survival and starvation. The lives of Russia's hereditary nobility provide us with great insight into the wider phenomenon of Russian cultural and political history. That's because the rituals, tastes, experiences, and priorities of Russia's privileged caste guided the country's development. Furthermore, the political alliance from 1613 to 1917 that the Russian nobility forged with the Romanov regime facilitated Russian expansion and development. But as we'll see in today's lecture, it also came at a tremendous cost to the Russian masses. In the popular resentment towards Russian nobility that ensued, we'll find some of the fissures in the Tsarist system that made the country ripe for revolution. Unlike English lords, Russian nobles didn't have much in the way of formal institutions, akin to the British parliament or the legacy of the Magna Carta, to aid their efforts to define and defend a set of coherent interests. They had no traditional rights from which to claim political power. Instead, their privileges came through an alliance with the Tsar's state. The rulers of Russia increased their territory and their individual power over the centuries. They went from being princes, at most first among equals, to czars, and then to emperors. They did so abetted by the Russian nobility. The older, medieval, princely families cast their lot with the Romanov's predecessor, the Danilovich branch of the Rurik dynasty, around the 15th century. In exchange for recognizing his authority, Ivan III, who ruled from 1462 until 1505 as Ivan the Great, granted these men sizable lands and estates from newly conquered territory, in addition to the lands they already controlled. He then enlisted some of them as advisors or counselors. With wealth and political power concentrated in Moscow, in a centralized state, Ivan became their czar and they became his boyars, or nobility. The boyars constituted a select group, even by aristocratic standards. Before Ivan's reign, there had been only about 40 boyar families. But the sovereign enlarged their numbers to solicit support and curry favor among those newly ennobled. By the time Ivan died in 1505, the number of boyars had quintupled to more than 200. And by this point, Ivan was not just a grand prince, a first among equals, but the sovereign, the Tsar.
To foreign visitors at the Muscovite court, the Tsar seemed to exercise almost despotic sway over even his most elite aristocrats. Ambassadors and foreign envoys to the Kremlin remarked on the staggering deference that the boyars showed to their sovereign. They would sit in silence as the ruler sat on his throne, seeming to these foreign visitors like little more than gilded servitors. At the same time, the Stanford University historian Nancy Coleman has shown that the Russians, by maintaining at least the facade of autocracy and adhering to the privileged authority of the sovereign, allowed for a measure of stability in an otherwise unstable world. The opportunity for a boyar to advance his position through a relationship with the Tsar was especially important because of that traditional practice of dividing one's estate among heirs, the practice known as partible inheritance. Allocating one's estate among all male children and siblings was intended to maintain the vitality of the extended family and noble line. But in fact, it weakened the aristocratic elite. The competition for land and power among brothers, cousins, and other relatives could be fierce amid a continuing diffusion of resources. One way to mitigate these potential feuds was through the system of misnichesva, which was early Russia's mechanism for protecting the order of precedence. Misnichesva ranked boyar families and their individual members. It was intended to preserve and perpetuate privilege and reduce the potential of civil war. Misnichesva determined what positions of boyars could hold in the Tsar's council and within the military. It stipulated that they could only serve under boyars of a higher rank and never serve under anyone whom they outranked. The only way that a boyar family could circumvent Misnichesva was through marriage. Marriage alliances offered the surest path to improving a clan's standing. These alliances were stepping stones to political power. Marriage alliances also served as a form of protection or insurance in the tumultuous world of aristocratic society. So boyars married into each other's clans to form alliances and establish factions. They could hold sway within the Tsar's court. Since advantageous marriages were such profitable commodities, young Muscovite noblewomen became a sort of currency. Marriage alliances were strategically crafted and questions of legitimacy were paramount. Boyars couldn't have their daughters' personal inclinations or desires interfere with the family agenda. And elite fathers guarded their daughters' virginity at all costs, since virginity was a basic criterion for establishing a young girl's value. To ensure noble girls' sexual purity, Muscovite Russia kept elite men and women separated. In the words of Nancy Coleman, throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, the wives and daughters of princes and boyars lived in quarters separate from men, didn't mix with them, and were shrouded by curtains or closed carriages in their rare public appearances. The separate living quarter of elite women was called the tarim. There, women lived together with their children in comfortable yet self-contained surroundings, often with their own chapel and bath. It might seem like boyar women were shut off from the rest of the world, but they interacted a great deal with each other. Boyar wives and relatives visited each other often and formed an elite network that shared information and wielded influence behind the scenes. The area in which elite women had the most influence was in arranging marriages. Wives and daughters interviewed bridal candidates and shared their opinions with their husbands and fathers. All marriages in Muscovite Russia carried political import, of which the most important was the Tsar's choice of a wife. Boyar clans with the daughter who married the Tsar hit the jackpot. As royal in-laws, they quickly became ensconced in the highest ranks of the court and circumvented Miss Nietzsche in a manner that was otherwise impossible. Beginning in the 18th century, Russian czars typically married foreign princesses. But after Ivan the Great married a Byzantine princess in the 15th century, his successors all the way through the 17th century preferred domestic brides. Now, you might expect this bride to be selected from among the most powerful boyar clans, 
But instead, Russian rulers at the time believed that the best way to minimize violent power struggles was to select a wife who was a relative outsider, not a commoner or a peasant, of course, but a daughter of a minor boyar whose father was not yet part of the czar's inner circle. The process through which the new Tsaritsa was chosen was typically a bride show. Royal courtiers were dispatched throughout the European part of Russia to inspect potential candidates from among the unmarried daughters of local landowners. Prospective brides were then brought to Moscow, and once in the Kremlin, the czar made his choice. Although the bride show was an important way to project the image of autocratic czar's power, leading boyars and their wives also played a key role in selecting the prospects. Perhaps the most noteworthy case of early modern social climbing is the example of Anastasia Romanovna Zakharina Yurovna. This daughter of a middle-ranking boyar married Tsar Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible, in 1547. And although their direct male line died out before the century even closed, her family's connection to the royal court were enough to have her great-nephew selected as Tsar Mikhail Romanov, in 1613. So through a bride show that put Anastasia before Ivan the Terrible and led to their marriage, her clan went from being an obscure minor noble family to the autocrats of all of Russia. Now that's what I call upward mobility. Most boyars of high rank lived in and around the Kremlin and ceremonial banquets at the Kremlin were boisterous affairs. Outfitted in rich golden garments, as many as 200 boyars would sit down at long tables, lined with tablecloths, where they were served boiled meats, vegetables, garlic, and onions out of large golden dishes. But if you're thinking that these were elegant affairs, think again. Of course, the table manners of the 16th century can't be compared to those of the 21st, but there was still an especially rustic character to Kremlin banquets. The only cutlery were spoons and the knives that the boyars might have brought with them. For the most part, they used their fingers to eat. With a bevy of food and cooks, especially heavy-handed with the garlic and onions, foreign diplomats remarked that the stink of these meals pervaded the Muscovite court. Banquets were command performances at the Kremlin. In order to hold sway and influence, a boyar needed to be present and take part in such court rituals. At the same time, the boyars could be ruthless in their machinations at court. After Ivan was orphaned at the age of eight, turmoil engulfed him as one boyar clan sought influence at the bloody expense of another. But in 1555, Ivan reminded the boyar clans of the hierarchical nature of the czar state by instituting what was known as the Code of Service. This law decreed that all state owners across Russia had to provide one fully equipped cavalryman for every 400 acres of land they owned. Even before this decree, some noble lands already had service requirements attached to them. These holdings were called pomiestia and couldn't be bequeathed to a landowner's heirs. Families that solely held pomiestia lands tended to be less wealthy and less influential than the, than the nobility that owned vochinas, or patrimonial estates, which had no service requirements attached. Prior to Ivan IV's code of service, the vochinas were considered the boyar's personal property and distinct from any obligation to the crown. But the new code of service made all land ownership conditional. This advanced the principle of autocratic rule for now. Even if a property had been in a family for generations, its ownership, and by consequence, the clan's very status as boyars, was dependent upon the favor of the czar. Soon enough, this dependency led to a dramatic reversal in fortune. In 1581, Ivan killed his eldest son and heir in a fit of rage. Three years later, Ivan himself died. This created con conditions for a period of uncertain succession, civil war, and foreign invasion. This approximately 30-year interval, which lasted until the election of Mikhail Romanov as czar in 1613, 
reached a crescendo from 1598 until 1613 in what is known as the Time of Troubles. In the midst of this turmoil, peasants sought to take advantage of an option denied them for all but two weeks of the year. They left their lands to seek better opportunities elsewhere. As a result, fields lay fallow and boyar incomes plummeted. In 1598, the boyars turned to the newly appointed Tsar Boris Godunov for help. He'd basically gotten the job because he'd married into the royal family, and there seemed to be no better options. With no real dynastic claim to the throne, Boris was motivated to hold on to the boyars' support. So he reintroduced a policy, first used sporadically by Ivan IV, called Forbidden Years. In an effort to maintain political control and economic stability, the new czar banned peasant migration, even during the harvest festival period and St. George's autumn holiday in November, the one time of year in which peasants had been permitted to leave their estates. Citing extenuating circumstances, the czar proclaimed certain years to be forbidden years for any peasant movement. In doing so, he basically tied the peasants to their boyars' estate during those years. This proved an immense financial benefit to the boyars and secured Boris their goodwill, albeit at the peasants' expense. When Boris Godunov died in 1605, new competitors for the Russian throne emerged, including ambitious boyars, foreign kings, and even men pretending to be the long-dead son of Ivan IV. A state of anarchy gripped the country. It settled only after a grassroots military campaign vanquished the foreign invaders and an assembly of Russian subjects selected Mikhail Romanov, the great nephew of the late Ivan's wife, Anastasia Romanova, to rule a czar. Still, peasant flight grew exponentially and the noble landowner's financial position dipped with each pleasant peasant worker who fled. So after political stability returned with the selection of the Romanov dynasty, the landowners now appealed to the new ruler for help. At first, Mikhail extended the time limits under which runaway peasants could be found and returned, but this proved insufficient. So in 1649, under his successor, Alexei, and a new law code called the Ulogenia, peasants were permanently bound to the noble estate in a relationship that was made permanent and cross-generational. In this way, a formal system of serfdom was instituted. For the next two centuries, the Romanov autocracy's alliance with the serf-owning nobility became an effective mechanism for mobilizing resources in the Russian state. By the second half of the 17th century, as much as 85% of the Russian population were serfs. Even so, the boyars began to see their political position weaken. Alexei Romanov regularly appointed new men to important posts at court and in the military, instead of appointing the hereditary nobility. In this way, he created a font of royal patronage that was formalized during the brief reign of Alexei's successor, Tsar Fyodor who abolished Misnichisva in 1682. Tsar Peter the Great, who came to power in his own right in 1689, viewed transforming the boyar class as a fundamental part of his larger design. It was at this time that the boyars disappeared and the Russian hereditary nobility became more akin to Western style aristocracies. Under Peter, when young noblemen turned 16, two-thirds of them were sent off to military service. The remaining one-third worked in the government. Peter also established a merit-based system for the military and civil service, which he called the Table of Ranks. In theory, individuals might even earn noble status, though few did. Instead, most new members of the nobility were from territory that was conquered and incorporated into the Russian Empire. At the start of the 18th century, about 15,000 men enjoyed noble status. By the start of the 20th century, that number was up to 1.2 million people, 
And although this noble elite constituted only 1% of the population, it jealously guarded its gentry status and became increasingly class conscious. In turn, the Romanovs passed legislation throughout the 18th century that confirmed the nobility as a property-owning class with the exclusive right to own serfs. After Peter the Great established the new capital of St. Petersburg in 1712, the city became its own path to wealth and influence. The most powerful nobles converged around Peter in palatial homes where they became the initial recipients and conduits of his westernization drive. For instance, in the first passages of Leo Tolstoy's masterpiece, War and Peace, published beginning in 1865, the Russian author introduces readers to the pervasiveness of spoken French among Russian nobles. He includes French phrases and sentences slipped into his characters' conversations without note or explanation. French was the spoken language of high society. It was to be expected. The Russian nobles who served in the new capital of St. Petersburg tended to be much more affluent than their provincial counterparts. They had to be. Living in the capital was expensive. If Moscow had its banquets, St. Petersburg had a slew of balls and wearing substandard attire was not an option. Dressing in luxurious French and German fashion came at a hefty cost. The vast majority of Russian nobles owned fewer than 100 serfs during the imperial period. This group was unable to afford the high costs of life in the capital and had to content themselves with the provinces. But many among those who enjoyed and defined the cultural diversions of St. Petersburg owned more than a thousand serfs. One of the most remarkable examples of noble wealth is that of the Stroganov family, who became members of the Russian nobility in the 18th century, though they had already been rich for centuries. Having made a fortune in trade, the Stroganovs funded expeditions across the Urals and into Siberia. The family became so wealthy via mining and furs that they often loaned money to various czars. For instance, they helped to fund the Tsar's naval dreams during Peter the Great's reign. In recognition, Peter ennobled the Stroganov family and bestowed the title of barons upon them. In turn, the Stroganovs employed their nobility and wealth to great purpose. Hugely appreciative of European and native cultures alike, the Stroganovs amassed an amazing art collection and founded one of the country's most important icon painting workshops. But the wealth of the Sheremeta family outpaced even that of the Stroganovs. By the end of the 18th century, Nicholas Sheremeta owned more than 200,000 serfs and 2 million acres of land. Both families had great influence on Russian culture. The Sheremetevs, with land holdings in more than 17 different provinces, took the added step of importing culture into the countryside. The Sheremetevs established theaters, orchestras, and art studios on their vast estates. This trend developed after the short-lived Emperor Peter III freed the nobles from compulsory service to the state beginning in 1762. In doing so, Peter provided the gentry with the opportunity to travel abroad and promote the blossoming of noble culture in the Russian provinces. Talented serfs themselves came to populate and perform in choirs, dance troupes, theatrical companies, and bands. Those who showed promise as actors, craftsmen, painters, and architects were trained in these arts and became the means to apply European culture in the distant countryside and provinces of Imperial Russia. The Russian nobility became better educated and more literate in the 18th century than ever before. In the first quarter of the century, between 1700 and 1725, 100 times more printed material was produced in Russia than in the whole of the previous century. The trend continued under Peter's successors. Schools of math, engineering, and navigation appeared. Russia's first university was founded during the reign of Peter's daughter, Elizabeth. And the newly founded academies of sciences and fine arts trained native Russian scientists and artists. However, 
as global markets expanded, Russian noble landowners found themselves borrowing increasingly large sums of money to maintain their lifestyles. An even greater challenge came in the middle of the 19th century in the wake of a devastating loss in the Crimean War and an urgent need to modernize the economy. In 1861, Tsar Alexander II abolished serfdom. He realized that Russia needed to modernize and industrialize. Still, it was an earth-shaking change that affected more than 22 million peasants. With the end of serfdom, the nobility lost their free labor source and some of their land, which was reallocated to the recently freed serfs. Still, the state treasury compensated the nobles for land turned over to the peasants. So the alliance between the state and the gentry remained intact. And let's not forget that the terms of the emancipation favored the nobility at the expense of the serfs. The nobles got to pick the lands they wanted to retain and set the price for lands they relinquished. Further, the freed serfs could receive only up to one half of the land they had previously worked. And from this diminished tillage, they had to pay back the state for the acquired lands over the next 49 and a half years. This isn't to say that the nobles' overall economic position flourished after the abolition of serfdom. Instead, many noble landowners floundered. This is depicted with wit and derision in plays like Anton Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard. The main character, Lubov Andreevna Ranievskaya, has borrowed beyond her means. As a visitor to her estate remarks, if in the course of your life, the energy you spent trying to find money to pay off your interest on your loans had been used for another purpose, then you would have been able to turn the earth on its axis. But instead of de developing her land and earning income from it, she's forced to sell her beloved cherry orchards to men who have made their money through manufacturing. A new era was on the horizon. After the abolition of serfdom, the number of landless nobles increased dramatically. Many of them couldn't turn profits without a free labor source, and they sold their land to pay off debts, just like Ranevsky and the Cherry Orchard. By 1905, only 30% of Russia's hereditary nobi nobility still owned land. By this point, most nobles earned their income through government service, either in the military or the growing bureaucracy. Still, some took advantage of changing times and fortunes. A more opportunistic breed of the nobility became wealthier than ever. In the early 20th century, a core of Russia's aristocrats earned annual incomes of in excess of 100,000 pounds sterling. But signs of the political earthquake to come emerged in 1905 and 1906. After Tsarist troops fired on peacefully marching workers outside the Winter Palace in 1905, noble estates throughout Russia were torched by angry peasants. Approximately 2,000 noble estates were destroyed as centuries of resentment percolated to the surface. And as frustrated peasants unleashed their fury on local nobles, even though the czars held autocratic power, the peasantry had long blamed the local landowners for their plight. But it was really the strategic alliance between the autocracy and the serf-owning nobility that was responsible for most of the peasants' disadvantages. After the October Revolution of 1917, the new communist rulers had no use for the men and women whose families once had profited from the labor of others. Rather, the Bolshevik state now required the official registration of former landowners, capitalists, and members of affluent classes. And once registered, the Soviet government expropriated the former elite's property and required them to perform arduous work for minuscule rations. So noble residents of the once fashionable parts of the city now dug graves for typhus victims and cleaned toilets in communal and government buildings. Designated as class enemies, they frequently were entitled to keep only one room of their grand mansions for themselves. The rest of the space and its contents were turned over to the working class. 
In the wake of the revolution, a Russian noble's family heirlooms often became essential to survival. They sold their jewelry, antiques, and art for a pittance. Elena Sheremetova, who once belonged to Russia's wealthiest family, sold the diamond tiara she had so often worn to balls at the Winter Palace for a bag of flour. In the new worker state of the Soviet Union, fortunes had dramatically changed. 